please welcome director Laura McGann. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Laura. Fantastic film. Um, Thanks for having me. It's I wanted to have space. When when did you make the decision to tell the story chronologically? At the very very start, we um, when I met with Peter, we we had coffee for about an hour and a half, and it was in 2018. And at the end of the coffee, uh, he put a pe little pen drive on the table, and he he said. You can, you know, have a look at what's on that. There's a couple of interviews on it, and it was like 12, almost 13 hours of audio interviews with Stephen, um, and that's when I you know, went home and, and and listened to it over the course of a couple of days, and I I realised that I kind of like I I set myself a challenge to maybe try and tell for you know Stephen could potentially tell his own story, mm -hmm. and to tell the story in the moment, rather than have people talking about somebody who had passed away and talking about his life, I felt, God, I wonder if it would be possible to go on the journey with Stephen and with Alessia. And that's when I also, uh, we didn't know what, I didn't know what archive was out there. There might have been nothing out there. Um, um, but it was, just a, it was just a gem of an idea that we kind of stuck with and then over over the years, we um, and also as an audience member, there's a sense of discovery that happens. And of course, when we find out of his death, we're like stunned. Uh, that was part of the pro that your your idea. It wasn't so much that you're stunned. It's just that you're all you. Nobody you know, he didn't know. Alessia didn't know. And you're with them, like any kind of narrative scripted film. You don't necessarily know what happens at the end mm -hmm. when you're watching it. And I, I wanted to kind of uh, try to give the audience that experience. Um, and, and that meant treating Alessia kind of like grammatically in the same way where we use her audio, we use her archive. And we spoke to, obviously we spoke to the 16 um, voices in the film. And, and we, we figured out what the story was first from these, from, from all of the people. And, uh, and then we, we sometimes would be one photo from an event and we'd say, I think that somebody, is that somebody with a GoPro in the background there? Who's that? Okay, that's Stefano. Does anybody know where Stefano is? Okay, he's, uh, he's in Italy. And I would say, Stefano, do you have, you know, that footage from 2006? And he'd go, and it was COVID, so everybody was at home and had time to go into the wardrobe and route through the hard drive. And he came back, he said, I've actually got 500 gigabytes of stuff between this year and this year, and Alessia is all over it. And, and that kind of just kept happening. Uh, one of our producers went and did a free diving course in Greece. Um, and at the end of it, uh, the guy Stavros was his name. He mm. said, "Oh, by the way, I've got all that. I, mm. I'll give you all that footage of Stephen saving Alexei um, from forty meters." So it was it was two years of um, wow. archive. Our archive producer was um, you know just putting all the tentacles out, and and um, we no no stone was left unturned. I think. I want to latch on to something you mentioned that you tell both of their stories and you give equal time to her story and to Hill's story. But you also mentioned something that struck me when I was watching the film, is that things are being told to us in, in the present tense, is that it's all happening, it feels, it feels like it's happening as we're watching it. And I don't recall seeing in a documentary that makes me feel the way that you made us feel. Was that a, a challenge to create that? That experience. Well, yeah, it depended on 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 a the archive, and it being it existing, um, and also then plugging in the gaps. You know where there there might be half of the scene is covered in archive, but the other half maybe isn't, or the other percentage isn't. And and we went and filmed in different locations, in the Blue Hole in Dahab, in Bahamas, in Mexico, um, with free divers. To, to plug in the holes. And we shot in a way that kind of reflected the way the scene was shot on the day. So if it was with GoPros, handling noise, you know, uh, shot by freedivers who 
nip down to 30 meters and then come back up and show I'd be on the surface holding on to a noodle. And they'd be like, we the Julie Gautier was our freediving cinematographer and she'd have a team of safeties around her and, and the diver and she'd go down to 30 and come back up and show me the shot and I'd say, that's great. Will you do that one more, one more time? Just slightly different. <laughs> And they go down and they pop out. And it was just having like having a fleet of dolphins on, on the team. So it was really incredible to have such an amazing wealth of archive as a filmmaker, you know, to get your teeth into a project that has this archive and is covered, you know, it's covered in the moment where you can tell the story of the day and you can you can be in the moment not knowing. Because that's kind of the way Stephen and Alessia, you know, they both have this like kind of wild streak, you know, that attracted me to them. Anyway, they do lots of things that I'm not brave enough to do, so I was able to, you know. And, and um, yeah, it, was, it just felt like the right way to tell their story. But blending the original archive material, the footage, and the, I mean, the, the original footage that you were capturing and the archival, it all looks seamless. You know, tell us about putting, you know, meshing those two worlds together, how challenging it must have been. Yeah, so it was it was very much like a lot of this the freediving archive that you see is shot by freedivers. So it's not it doesn't look like Blue Planet, you know, where there's these lovely static shots. It's different. It's got a fluidity to it. It's got movement because the freediver who's shooting it doesn't have a tank on. So they're moving up and down at speed, which you also can't do with the tank on, and they're moving with the diver. So it you know, when I watched, I read about um Stephen's accident, that's when that's how I heard about this story. You know, Googled what is free diving after I so I was met with all of these videos. And um and that's what I saw. It was the free divers shooting it that made it made it different. So we shot anything that we any gaps that we need to plug in. We shot it in the same style. We didn't shoot it on GoPro. We shot a little bit of it on GoPros actually. Um, but we shot it in the same style as the archive was shot mm -hmm. and, and storyboarded. You know, we very much had almost a fine cut of the scenes and I storyboarded um, the, the shots that we But needed. you mentioned that the, that the, you know, the GoPro shots, that free diving was, is through the eyes of the, the free driver, I mean the free diver, but Will you actually incorporate different points of view so the dive becomes this kind of like 360, um, you know, tell us about that. Yeah, so there were some moments where, uh, and again, we were reflecting what they do. Sometimes they have a, a camera strapped to them. Sometimes they're shooting themselves. Sometimes somebody else is shooting them. And, and in the fatal dive, we have the, the spine of the dive, Alessia going down, going across. And then, you know, the footage from the day of Stephen uh, going after her. And, and then for, for the other people who were there, it was very much like getting their account of what happened. And then literally just shooting sometimes their perspective. So you don't even see them, but you know what's going on for them because you're, you're seeing the environment and the scene from their perspective. So it was, it was kind of like small little things like that 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 it, 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 we leaned into kind of the, the realism and the simplicity. You know, at one point there was like, how are we gonna, how are we gonna shoot the arch? Um, and we can't go to the arch, it's 50 meters down. Are we gonna build a set? What are we gonna do? No, we can't do that, we don't have any money to do that. Um, and, and we went to a cenote and there was a lovely little shallow roof and Alessia swam under it and Julie, swam in front of her and it was just so simple and it's exactly the way all of their kind of archive is mm -hmm. is shot as well it's just very it's just two divers and you know your dp tim craig um you know tell us about how did you guys arrive into shooting with anamorphic lenses and then you I was struck by seeing that there were moments that you feel a sense of freedom and openness, but then you make us feel claustrophobic as well. Um, and then the other question regarding the photography is also about the depth, where um, the underwater scenes, you give us a sense of scale, and, and the but at the same time, a sense of that the claustrophobia and the depth. 
complicated uh, question, I know. It is, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Tim, Tim brought his ex expertise. Tim shot all of the interviews, so all of the underwater stuff was done by free divers or, or scuba divers. And Tim, Tim was an amazingly collaborative person to work with. And we uh, we discussed what you know obviously what we wanted the the interviews to look like, and we and we wanted them to again feel like the person that you may have walked into a, you know a coffee shop or a bar in in Dahab and put your elbow up on the bar and be talking to Christoph who's sitting there in the seas behind him, you know, and then Christoph heads off, you know. So we wanted it to feel like it was in that world with all the like maybe you were in a beach house or or the sea was kind of just there, so that it felt like you weren't coming out to an interview again to try and keep us in, in the moment. Um, in terms of the, the scale, the, the idea of the freedivers talk, um, Christoph again puts it really beautifully about how you, you go into the water, you put your face in the water, and all the shit from daily life just fades away, and it just creates a quiet. And it kind of reminded me of the idea of this being a speck of dust in the universe. And that's kind of like what maybe I imagine sometimes you feel like when you're maybe 30 meters down and, you know, it, it could be two meter, 200 meters deep. There's nothing around you and it's just you and, and the blue. And I really wanted to create that sense of scale. And, and that's what we, we did, especially in the, with the shot of Stephen waiting was just really important to see that here's just a person like in this vast blue space, alone, waiting, holding their breath. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the same time, you're in with them because it is, holding your breath is quite a claustrophobic feeling as well. So it was, th there was that kind of contrast of, of kind of feeling, feeling expansive, but also feeling quite trapped. Mm -hmm. And when I introduced the film, I told them to keep an eye out not keep an eye out, to listen to the sound design, which is breathtaking, uh, pun intended. Um, you hear different sounds, you hear the depth, you understand sonically the depth, you also hear the breath, of course, but you also, the, yeah, I, sometimes I felt like I was listening to the internal organs. You know, tell us about the, the sound design. Again, that was another, as a filmmaker, it was another incredible opportunity to get your teeth into something really creative where you could draw on what the divers were saying to us about, you know, because you have to equalize your ears as you go down the pressure of the sea. So you have to kind of uh, keep a little bit of air. This is going to sound like, try this at home later. Keep a little bit of air in the back of your throat and push it out your ears. So that's what they do. Um, and it, it's like, holding your nose on a plane and unblocking your ears. Um, but all the time there is a pressure and you have to keep unblocking them. So it's like, what does that pressure sound like? What does, you know, 50 meters of, of, of water above your head sound like? And can you hear, and that was one of the things is that, you know, you block your ears like that and you can hear your, your heartbeat and you can hear different sounds that who knows whether it's your mouth or your throat. Um, but also with this, the sea, we wanted to, I, you know, I don't know other than that what it sounds like at 40, 50, 60 meters. So with this amazing um, kind of uh, opportunity to build that using Foley and using different things that already existed, um, we had a team of sound designers in Molinaire in London who um, did an incredible job. And each scene, the sea sounded different, you know, depending on where you are, if you're in the Bahamas or if you're in Italy or if you're in Ireland, you know, um, they all had a very different sound. And, and that kind of, I thought that it was just an opportunity for us as filmmakers to, to give the sea of the day a character and also for it to reflect the emotions of the person that we were kind of with at the time. Mm -hmm. um, the sequence of the accident, um, it is so detailed. Um, I remember watching it and I knew exactly where each of them were at a particular moment. Um, the amount of, you, you know, tell us about putting that sequence together and, and the amount of detail, as I said, specificity to that sequence. 
Sure, I suppose it was something that was very important to me, to all of us, that we just got that exactly right and we didn't uh, veer away from the, the facts. And, and, and the freediving, um, the team in Dahab did an incredibly detailed accident report after it happened. And it detailed second by second what was supposed to happen and second by second then of what actually did happen from everyone's point of view. So it was important to me. We, we also drew on, on the accident report, but also the, the testimony of the people who were there. And each person only spoke to exactly what they were involved in or what they saw, not you know something that they heard about that was happening on the other side of the blue hole. Um, and, and that was how we, it was a jigsaw of going to Nathan, go, it, it, there was like four or five different scenes almost going on at the same time that were part of this one bigger story of, of the dive and seeing the ripple effect of one person's decision uh, you know, playing out for, for everybody else. And, and really for, for us with this, it was, it was about sticking to um, exactly what we knew happened and not veering away from that because it was just such a pivotal moment that we didn't want to draw any conclusions that we were, you know, um, coming to ourselves. Did you, how many drafts of the script did you do before you actually started shooting? And, or is that something that you, afterwards with the editing, you start working with the narrative? So I did four drafts of the script before, I think I started off with the terrible 260 page thing. Um, and and then obviously whittled it down and and changed it around. At one point we had vertical blue playing all the way through it, and and we played around with different ideas. But it always came back to the strength of the of the story that is there, and it didn't. Uh, I felt like it didn't need um, any any messing around with or or any fancy tricks, it just needed, it was such a strong story in itself that it just needed to be told well. Um, and and also one of the things that I worked quite hard on was, um, you know, for it's you're halfway through the second act before our two main kind of participants meet. So you've got these two stories and it was important to me that it felt like one story. So lifting the lid on the why, why are you doing this and, and what are you willing to do in order to reach your goals or, or, or um, you know, for your dreams to come true or what, you know, if, to just find that thing that you're looking for. And, and there was just such a call and response between Alessia and Stephen's stories and their characters as well. It, it, it was like they were each other's missing piece. You know, and and weaving that into finding the scenes that really showed that, so you felt like these are two people, and they are the end to each other's yang, and we're going with them, and you just building that feeling of when they meet, you know, something kind of incredible is going to happen. Before I saw your film, I knew nothing about free diving, and I'm watching the opening sequence, and there's no words. You basically show us everything about free diving and you also show us the sheer terror and the danger of it um, without any words. Uh, in a different documentary, you will have this talking head explaining, well, this is what they do and blah, 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 blah. Instead, you show us, it's such a brilliant way to start the film. Tell us about how did you arrive at that bold choice? Yeah, well, of course, we, uh, I wrote plenty of drafts where we did have people explaining all kinds of things, and it just never did it justice, and you can't explain it. You know, one, now that you've all sat through that dive, it's impossible to really grasp it without... It, the, uh, the piece that you don't get if you don't sit with it is time, I think, and that's the powerful um, the tool of, like, allowing asking the audience to sit and potentially perhaps hold their breath and watch it play out in, in real time, in the moment, watch it get darker. Because initially, I remember seeing it for the first time. That was it, and I was like, I need the audience to, to experience what I've just experienced 
of like, you know, kind of awful. Initially, you're like, this is really cool. Isn't she very good at this? And then you're like, Christ, she's still going, okay. And then, you know, there's a whole range of emotions and you get more and more serious and it goes from being this like beautiful thing that you're looking at to being like, you know, uh, curled up in a ball watching this happen, holding your breath and awful tension in your in your chest. And and, and there was no way to, uh, and also the, 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 there was no point in us telling anybody anything else about this story until they understood what free diving is and also what the stakes are. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this was just felt like it, it just did that in a very, again, very just simple way. And you've, of course, you were there when some of the dives were happening. You make it, to us, look so exciting and thrilling. As a spectator, when you're there and watching them go, is it as, as exciting as you make it look? Do you know what it it a B because we did go to Vertical Blue in twenty one, and there is uh, you know as a person who was there f that was the first time I'd ever seen free diving in real life, and when that diver disappears from view, you have your snorkel on, you're watching. You just all kind of and it's complete silence on the surface, and you're just waiting. Nobody speaks, and it is it's terrifying. You know, it is terrifying and everyone, there's just the person has disappeared and everyone's just silently, quietly, calmly, hoping they come back. Um, you open the documentary with listening to her tell us how she feels about death. Did you, how, how has her perception of death changed from what she experienced? Well, massively, you know, that's the kind of her, Part, massive part of, of Alessia's arc is that, you know, before this happened, that's what everybody feels like when they're 24. You don't think about death. You're not, no 24 year old is walking around thinking, God, what if, what if I get hurt doing this? You know, it's, it's the young person's, you know, thing of, of not being worried. It's only when you get a bit older and you go through stuff and you realize that what death is and what grief is and that, you know, things can happen and people die and they don't come back. And it's only, I think, when you go through that, that, that you realize that the impact that maybe what you're doing has on other people. So it felt like it was a massive part of Alessia's arc and it was a good place to start because obviously, you know, the story is, is, that, is that changing, I suppose. Quirky question here. Um, the the majority of the, and correct me if I'm wrong, the majority of the people that you talk, the outside voices are female and are women. And was that intentional on your part? No. Okay. <laughs> just, I was just, no. Yeah, the, uh, no, they were the people that were in the room, you know, um, and they were the people that were able to speak to the moments that we, um, that we were in, and I uh, thoroughly enjoyed hearing, you know, you don't in documentaries hear many women speak about, um, you know, uh, something technical, you know? And also, oh, somebody said to me last night, I can't remember, I'm sure you guys know what the term is, um, where you have two women on screen and they're not talking about a man, that that's called something. Um, what is it? That's it, the Bechtel rule, yeah. I need to look it up, but that's, but somebody said that to me last night and I was like, she said, that's not that common in films to, to see that. And it, look, I suppose, um, I, uh, yeah, it's, it, it wasn't intentional um, because you want to tell the best story and these are the people that spoke to the moment in the best way, so. Mm -hmm. you're, you're so respectful. Um, to their stories. Um, was that something that stressed you, uh, being respectful to both Alessia and to Stevens? It was absolutely what was in the forefront of my mind from the word go till the very end to now and always will be. Um, you know, Alessia and Peter and Stevens' family 
were always going to be the first audience and, and every decision I made throughout the film, I considered them. And you know, sometimes, you know, there's moments in say Vertical Blue where Alessia isn't, you know, at her best. Um, or moments where, where Stephen's pushing a bit too hard. And, and, I, and, and I wanted to be fair to them um, and be truthful. And, and I was very nervous. We had a week, I think we screened it to Peter in his home with his family on the Tuesday. And uh, he said that we took a little break, actually, an intermission, and then we came back and we watched the rest of it. And then he said that he thought it was fair. And that, for me, I was like, that's all I wanted. You know, I just wanted you to see what you knew was true. And, and to be okay with seeing it. And, and with Alessia as well, myself and John and Sarah went to Rome on the Thursday. Um, and as you can imagine, yeah, very stressed. Um, and Alessia took a moment after, after the film finished and then she turned to me and she said, thank you. And I, of course, burst out crying and, you know. Um, but but it, was, it was just, I just followed my gut, and my gut instinct, instinct in terms of, what the story was and 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 how to tell it in a respectful way and um and I'm I'm just so glad that they were happy with it and, and one of the things that um Alessia actually a couple of days after watching it for the first time she asked me for a copy of it because she wanted to sit down and show a couple of people in her life like her coach and different friends the film so that she didn't have to explain what happened that she could just show them the film and I just thought because she gave so much to this film through the interviews and through coming on shoots and s spending time with me, explaining everything to me, um, that the fact that she, it would be somehow useful to her was like really amazing to, to, to know that she got something out of it all. And why would you like the audience to get away, to, get, to take out from watching your film? A lot of people say, oh my God, I won't free dive after that, but I, I, I do. <laughs> uh, and then some people say that's all they want to do. Um, but I think like the, the beauty of the ocean is something that I think uh, I respect in the ocean. But also it's a, it's a story of love in so many ways and, and human connection and, and like what is life about. And, and it's, you know, there's kind of thoughts on grief in there as well. Um, and there's, there's, yeah, it's, it's. I, I'd hope that people kind of find Alessia and Stephen's story kind of aspirational, and yeah. Well, and you've done a phenomenal job. I, I'm in awe of what you've achieved. It's a really spectacular film, and thank you for for being here tonight. Thank you so much, and thanks for this lovely chat and for coming on. Of course, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.